Well, good morning, everybody. Um, thanks very much to Paolo and, and Sergio for the invitation to give this presentation. I'm going to change tack a little bit here and give a, a more generic perspective of where I think uh, systems identification and modeling has an impact in the process control field and where that is likely to, to go into the future. Uh, before I do that, I just want to put up a, a few pictures which uh, Sergio might, uh, oh, it's not very clear, yeah. might recognize. Um, can you see, Sergio? Yes. <laughs> I can see. I can recognize. Uh, I see also the detail. There's Sergio's office. <laughs> uh, and this is another picture taken at Sergio's office with my two daughters here. And this is, ah, uh, oh, that's better. Uh, Sergio and uh, Frank Doyle and myself, our last officers meeting in Luxembourg for, for IFAC. Um, I've come to know Sergio over the years as a, as a, a very dignified person who, who, despite his many achievements, always remained very humble. So it's something to, to look up to, Sergio. Thank you. Uh, so what I'd like to talk about is a, a couple of trends which I, I think is going to be very important in future. Uh, digital twins, uh, lights out process control, uh, industries becoming democratized. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about the role of modeling and SID in establishing uh, advanced process controllers and also maintaining them. And then I don't have much time to talk about this, but I'll talk about some of the, uh, the ways that uh, these impact on the research themes that we are busy with um, in my group and then give some concluding thoughts. So just as, as a background, uh, in the first machine age, we had human muscle power being replaced by machine power, and then animal muscle power uh, being replaced by machine power. And we're now in what's, what's called the second machine age where human brain power is being replaced by digital technologies. And there's a nice book here by Andrew McAfee and um, Eric Brynjolfsson describing this, this process. And part of the reasons why this is possible is because of Moore's law. Everybody has heard of, of Moore's law. Uh, uh, we've had an exponential growth in computing power since, since about 1900 in different forms. And then the second reason is that uh, you get an increased interconnection between computing devices. There's estimates that in 2020 we'd have between 20 and 50 billion devices connected. So there's, there's an increase in computing power which is exponential. And we're now on the second half of the chessboard, if you use that chessboard analogy of technology doubling every year. And with all these devices interconnected, uh, many things are becoming possible, which wasn't possible in, in the past. Now, the concept of a digital twin um, talks about virtual models of processes, products, and services. So this is a picture which is not so clear here, but a virtual model of a ship. There's a virtual model of a person. And what these are is a, a collection of as actual physics-based models reflecting the exact operating conditions, such as performance and failure modes in the real world. Uh, there was some talk at the IFA Congress last week about uh, digital twins. It's constantly used in the manufacturing industries a lot. And it's related to this Internet of Things concept, which makes it cost-effective to implement. Uh, a further potential profound impact uh, on control is the fact that with advances in sensing, digitization, computation, storage, networking, and software, all industries are becoming computable, as they say, industry becomes computable, it goes through some phases, it moves from being digitized to disrupting the industry to democratizing the industry. Now, you can maybe think about that concept, but it, potentially it can have profound impact on the, on the, especially the process control field, which I'm more familiar with. Now, this, this quote is uh, attributed to Tom Vucek from Autodesk, he's a fellow at Autodesk, and it's and it's, I got it from this book, Thank You for Being Late, by Thomas Friedman, which is, which is his latest book. Um, what I'd like to spend a bit of time on is, is lights out process control. This is where 
a fully automated process plant in which no human intervention or supervision is needed. And some of the questions I want to look at related to this concept is, uh, will the second machine age technologies make the lights out control possible? Uh, when is it likely to happen? Where are we now? And what needs to be in place for it to happen? Now, this is uh, obviously not a new concept in control to take somebody out of the loop. Uh, so feedback of engineered system is essentially about, about doing exactly that. And some of the reasons for doing that is algorithms uh, running on computers can close loops faster than human operators can. Uh, computers can run continuously. Uh, it might be dangerous to have people in certain loops. And systems can be miniaturized. You can't have a little person inside your mobile phone uh, doing the control. Um, So, so when is this likely to, to happen? Uh, let's, let's have a look at some studies that were done. This is a well-quoted study by two academics at Oxford University looking at the future of employment, uh, which jobs are susceptible to computerization. And I'm just highlighting some of the, the, the jobs which are related to operators. Uh, the one that's most likely to be computerized telemarketers uh, and then the least likely is recreational therapist, according to this, uh, this slide. And then there are many places where operators occur. This is in the, in the process industries. These are the guys who actually run the, run the processes. Uh, engineers are, are not very likely, and also academics also not very likely, according to this study. Uh, but what they say is that uh, about half of US employment is in the highest category meaning that it could be potentially automatable over the next decade or two. This was, study was done in 2013. And something that uh, ties into this is uh, this study from the Reserve Bank of St. Louis, um, looking at routine versus non-routine jobs, uh, cognitive versus manual. Uh, non-routine manual jobs have been increasing. Uh, routine manual jobs is stagnating, and they can be replaced by robots. And then uh, routine cognitive jobs also stagnating. That can be replaced by software, essentially, or software robots. Non-routine cognitive is increasing. And you can follow the money as well, see why that is. Um, this is a study done about 45 years of, of following salaries in the US uh, This versus education level. So this is people who drop out of college, oh, drop out of school, finishing high school, dropping out of university, finishing a bachelor's degree, finishing master in science. So people that uh, are well educated uh, tend to get increased uh, <coughs> salaries where the rest are stagnating. Um, so this is a good slide to show to, to finally a students at university to attract them to go and study postgraduate. To show, to show to Trump who says, I love the uneducated. Yeah, <laughs> because they vote for him. Yeah. <laughs> you know what Adrian Lincoln said? God sure loved common people because he made so many of them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so just uh, some anecdotal evidence as to, as to where we are now. This is a slide that uh, <laughs> partly got from Tariq Samad, who was at Honeywell at the time, showing uh, production per operating in the refining industries in the U.S., Refining has stayed more or less the same, has increased a little bit, but there's a factor of four decrease in the number of people actually operating these plants over the last 35 years or so. Uh, this is the German gas company, Linda, who advertised for a job in their Stuartville, New Jersey site for a remote operator. This is a guy who's only got a high school with two years experience controlling six plants all over North America doing it remotely, starting it up, and, and uh, law management, process disturbance, and things like that, plant shutdowns and restarts. Here's an example from the pharmaceutical uh, industry, where they talk about lights out approach uh, for a, a protein uh, refinery operation, talk about robust control strategies, adaptive feedback control, things, things that uh, we also talk about in our domain. And then also the big mining companies. This is a Cisco case study of Anglo Platinum, which is the biggest platinum mine in the world. 
talking about remotely supporting systems, especially the advanced process control group, doing remote monitoring and uh, maintenance of the advanced process controllers. Okay, so the role of modeling and systems identification in establishing and maintaining advanced process control. Uh, just want to look at some of the uh, impacts that uh, these technologies have. Uh, and I'm going to use MPC as an example because it's the most often used. Uh, it's implemented on thousands of processing plants. And if you want to improve economic performance, that's the easiest way to do it is, is to use uh, advanced process control. Uh, so I'm going to have a look at some of the steps that are taken in order to establish a controller. Uh, it starts off by motivating uh, MPC or doing economic motivation so that you can actually get the money to buy the, the system. Pre-test and preliminary configuration. This is uh, making sure that the base layer is functional. Uh, plant testing, plant model identification, model and controller development, and then controller commissioning, training, and then monitoring and maintenance. Uh, economic motivation of MPC, this is something I worked on quite extensively of, uh, about 10 years or so ago. Um, these are the steps that are taken. You identify where you are now, you design a controller, you test the controller and see if it makes the money that you say it's going to make using models. And then once you, once you can justify the purchase of the controller, you go ahead and implement it. And then you can do economic performance assessment with real data. So this is the point where you motivate the, motivate the funding required to initiate the process. And you need process models in all these steps in order to uh, generate the, the funding required. And then in terms of plant uh, testing, plant model identification, obviously MPC is a model-based approach, so you need a model. Uh, typically, people would perform uh, systems identification to generate data uh, for plant model identification, which can be done either manually or, or automatically. Um, and developments have made model identification essentially uh, routine, for, especially for linear time invariant uh, process models. So we've, we've gone from sort of local storage, where you actually store data on tapes and things like that, to being able to do plant tests from anywhere in the world. And then step uh, four and five, this is where you use test data to derive plant models. Um, you do the MPC design, you test the control and simulation, and then you go and test the, the control on the actual plant. And for many implementations, the plant model identification, the controller design and also the testing the control on the plant has been been automated. So you can buy software from vendors like Aspen and Honeywell, ABB as well, <laughs> where, 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 this is, where the, this is automated. So the time that it takes to establish a controller has been reduced substantially and it, it's a lot easier to do now. Um, where it's not so simple is to keep the controller running over an extended period of time. So MPC performance monitoring and maintenance when some degradation is detected is, is actually not so easy to do. So keeping controllers running as intended for extended periods of time is difficult due to plant changes that could happen, lack of operating experience, and the technology essentially not being that robust yet. Uh, so MPC performance deterioration once is a, a growing concern amongst end users. Systems would get implemented and then not work so well after a while. Uh, this is an area of, of, of active research still. Uh, this is a framework seven, which is a few years old now already. Program read, that was run by Paul von Hoff, Advanced Autonomous Model-Based Operations of in Industry Systems, called Auto Profit. And what they looked at is to use economics to justify how to adapt the process if you, uh, if you detect, detect some degradation. Uh, so you elect some, uh, select some appropriate action, model structure assessment, uh, least costly re-identification or retuning the model-based application, depending on what, what is appropriate. So just in summary for, for establishing uh, 
and maintaining advanced process controller has become easier, quicker, and hence cheaper to establish these controllers. Uh, modeling and SID is, is integrated into essentially all these steps, but uh, a lot more research is required to achieve autonomous MPC. So I want to change a bit tack here, uh, talk about, talking about uh, a section of the process control industry which uh, I've been uh, pretty active in. It's, it's the uh, model processing industry. And what we're talking about here is taking raw material, uh, pushing it through a crusher, a grinder to liberate the, the minerals that you want to extract. It gets separated in a uh, a concentrate, which is the valuable material, and uh, there's some reject, um, either using flotation or leaching. And then you've got some extractive metallurgy steps where um, the valuable metals are extracted. So that <clears throat> what I want to focus on for this particular presentation is just quickly talking about crushing and grinding. Uh, because this is where the most energy is consumed, there's some estimates say up to 5% of the world's energy consumption is, goes into these processes, which is, which is a serious number. Um, so we've got a, a number of the research themes in, in this area. One is plant-wide control, which I'm not going to talk about here. But the, the other one is uh, uh, developing models, or what we now say to students, digital twins. It sounds much, much more enticing to, to modern students to talk about that. Uh, and then the second one is light out process control tools. Uh, so the, the first theme, uh, the purpose here is to develop models that should be amenable for advanced process control studies. Um, and the methodology that we follow is to develop uh, fundamental or semi-empirical semi models of processes and to validate it with real process data. And once you've got the model, you can use it in, in many other studies. Uh, we've developed models for grinding mill circuits, flotation circuits, coal processing, uh, which is uh, relatively new in this industry, which is a very old industry. Which is, and then uh, pressure leach circuits, which is also used in uh, platinum refining. So the process I'm going to talk about here is, is grinding mill circuits, where you have solids, water, and steel balls fit into a, a grinding mill, discharges into a sump, and you then have a hydrocyclone classifier, which classifies the fine material, which is the product of the circuit, and also the coarse materials fed back into the mill. Now, this, this uh, circuit is very difficult to model compared to other, maybe other process control uh, models because uh, of various factors. One is the natural occurring uh, mineralogical textures, which, which can be very complex. And then also the fracture process that occur when the ore is crushed in ground is also very uh, unpredictable. The type of model will depend on the purpose. So if you want to design a circuit, you would use a different model from when you would um, design a controller. Uh, we focus on a phenomenological model-based uh, grinding circuit simulators, uh, which can also be used for process design if you, if you have, make it complex enough, but also for optimization and, and training. And the population balance method of modeling provides a unifying framework for tying all these models together. Uh, typically, when people uh, uh, design something like an MPC controller for these plants, they use LTI models, which uh, they use systems identification to, to obtain. So I'm going to talk a bit about two simplified models that we've, we've developed. If one looks at a, a grinding circuit, it's got uh, these inputs, ore that's fed in, water, steel, uh, and then the pump speed to the cyclone, you can change the mill speed as well if you do it uh, in the right way. And these are the outputs as particle size is the quality of the product, sump level, and mill load needs to be controlled for stability because they're essentially integrators. And then the cyclone feed density also has quite an impact on the, on the quality of the product. There's some disturbances, uh, the ore texture and the ore composition. Uh, which, which typically is unmeasured. And then you've got internal state variables such as holdup of materials in the mill and the sump. You've got different stream characteristics like percent solids, composition, size distribution, 
And then uh, mold power and rheology has a big impact on the, on the process as well. Now, when I started working in industry, this is the kind of models that we would identify for a process like this because uh, many of these things cannot be measured, such as ore grindability, the rheology of the slurry. The size distribution also is not measured uh, often. Uh, so, we, so we reverted to linear time invariant models such as this using systems identification type tests to develop them. Uh, Gray might remember Ian McLeod, eh? yeah, who visited you at some stage. So the model that we uh, developed has got four uh, modules, a feeder module, uh, a mill, sump, and hydrocyclone uh, module. And it's modularized, so you can, you can stick them together in different ways to, to have arbitrary circuit configurations. Um, the model has five, or the mill model has five states, water, solids, fines, rocks, and balls. And the solids consist of coarse and fine ore. Uh, the, uh, the, the uh, solids are smaller than the discharge grate, so this is the, at the end of the mill, where the solids can actually leave the mill, and the rocks stay, stay behind because they're too big to discharge. And then the, the <coughs> fines is the product that actually leaves the milling circuit, and the coarse ore will get fed back into the mill. Uh, there are generation and consumption terms for, for these states, uh, which are dependent on the slurry rheology and also on mill power. And then the hydrocycle model, because its dynamics is much faster than the mill, uh, is algebraic uh, equations. And just to, to give you some idea of what these look like, uh, these population balance models for each state. So what flows in minus what flows out. This is, <coughs> this is the mill water. Solids, solids flowing in minus solids flowing out, plus a rock consumption term. So the rocks break down there and feed into the, into the solids. And then the fines, you've got fines in minus fines out plus, plus a fines production term. And then uh, the rocks decrease as the rocks get consumed and the balls also decrease as the balls get consumed. Are the values space dependent? Do you have a partial for time, partial during for time? Is there also spatial variation? It could be. Okay. Yeah. Um, but depending on how and what kind of detail you want to, want to model them all. Uh, so it's a... I'm not going to go through these in detail, but just to give you an indication of the nonlinear nature of the model. So these are the, some of the state variables. Uh, there's the rheology factor. There's some densities. There's the power. The power is typically a quadratic function like this. There's the rheology factor, <coughs> factor term. <coughs> I promise Frank I'll show some equations in my, in my presentation. So, so here. Uh, typically, we... We publish this work in, in domain-specific journals like Minerals Engineering, Power Technology. Um, the modeling part, and then when we get to the control, we publish it in the control journals. So the second uh, part, of, part of the research thing that I want to talk about here is, is developing tools that enable plants to run without uh, human intervention. Uh, and these are things like observers of mill constituents, um, water solids, and, and Balls and rocks, uh, disturbance observers, uh, model plant mismatch detection. So if you if you want to maintain the integrity of the control, you have to follow what the model is doing, and then also active fault tolerant control to achieve optimal performance in the presence of faults. So what happens if the, if there's a fault? Should you still continue running the pro process? If you do so, will it be economically viable to do that, or should you st stop and, and and shut down the process? So this is the kind of things that you would have in a, in a, uh, a lights out configuration. So you've got actuators and sensors which could generate faults. Um, you have state and parameter estimation. You have a fault detection isolation scheme. And depending on which faults you, you generate, you have a control regime governor which decides whether you should still uh, operate the plant with, with the fault or whether you should maybe stop uh, and fix the fault relative to the objectives that are set for the, for the controller. And, and this work we uh, published mainly in the in general process control. There's uh, some disturbance observers, uh, parameter estimation, uh, also ob ob observation of the holdups in the, in the mill, and then uh, 
recently we published this paper, should I shut down my processing plant and what the conditions are uh, in order to do that. Then if you want to go to, this is unit process operation, if you want to go plant-wide, uh, you need horizontal integration of up and downstream uh, processes and vertical integration from the sort of boardroom down to the shop floor and, and back. And the way that, uh, what you need to do in order to, to achieve that is to have a, a digital twin of these unit processes and also of the products that flow between the unit processes. So, so this will typically happen in the cloud and it will be synchronized and, and, and on, a, on a sort of global scale. And if you can get that right, you can uh, optimize the, the supply chain from your, customer, from your customer's customer to your supplier's supplier kind of, kind of thing. So this is uh, typically still a, a long way off. Uh, I just want to finish with some concluding thoughts here. Uh, modeling systems identification is becoming even more important as more and more industries become digitized. And this is going to, you can maybe think for your own uh, work that you're doing, this is going to have serious impact in the future on the way that engineers are going to interact with, uh, with processes. Um, then in terms of uh, the lights out process control concept, uh, most process operator jobs will be automated away, especially for very uh, routine type of, uh, of processes. And production personnel will become fewer, but more sophisticated. So you might have, have a PhD or a master's running a, a process instead of a uh, high school graduate, depending on, on the sophistication of the process. Um, <clears throat> so unit level lights out process control is likely for many plants by in a uh, about 10 years or so. Uh, that would require comprehensive process models, uh, preventative maintenance techniques, online fault detection, isolation, and being able to reconfigure the controller depending on what faults you do generate. And then plant-wide lights out process control is likely to take longer, I would think. Not many, not many uh, companies get the vertical integration right now, even though it's possible. Uh, so I don't, I don't see that happening that quickly. And what you would likely require uh, is uh, detailed digital twins of the entire process. This is not just modeling like I've described here, but also modeling in detail every actuator, every sensor, and how it links in, into the process. In-depth process knowledge of, of how up and downstream processes affect each other, and then uh, Many companies have training simulators that they use to train operators. And these are typically very detailed. So that might be a starting point for, for this kind of work. Thank you very much.